What's up everyone, it's Ventus, and welcome to the patch 5.14 analysis. Unlike the last patch, this one is actually quite small, but it does include quite a few important features. So, as always, this video will not just focus on the changes, uh, but it'll talk more about how the changes affect the champion, how the items affect champions, and just the game overall. I'll start by going over all the changes, going down the list, and then closing out the video with a summary of this patch, a short review of key topics, and uh, basically a review of the previous patch analysis video and the, pr the predictions from the previous video. And to end things off, to finally end things off, um, predictions for what this patch will mean uh, going into the future. If you only care about specific sections, you can check the timestamps in the description for champions, items, the things that you are interested in, they'll all be there. Um, and finally, one last thing in this short introduction, the, uh, the new featured game mode that will be in the game in the near future is actually really cool, and it's actually a lot different than the previous ones. So what I did was I made a video about it because I thought that it needed a little bit more attention. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can check out what's up uh, with that video. You can check the annotation, and in the description below, the link to the video that I made on Black Market Brawlers. So, now let's get down to business. This is patch 5.14, starting with the HUD update. The uh, HUD update is now in-game, but only in normal games. It's not in-game for, for ranked matches yet, so if you want to test it out, just go into a normal game, play a normal game, and try and get used to it. It's actually kind of annoying. Um, they added something recently that, like, normally, okay, when you get something like a HUD change, uh, everything looks really different, and it takes some time for you to get used to. But I think in the last week or two, they added another different, another change to the HUD that really, really annoyed me, which was the timer. It used to be bottom right, uh, next to your score, next to your CS, uh, next to the minimap, so everything is just focused in that bottom right corner. Now... For some reason, they moved the timer to the top right. So, like, I don't understand that at all. But I guess they're going through with it that way. Um, but let them know that this is a stupid change. Because why would you have all the focus on the bottom side of the screen and then have, like, one little thing on the top? And it's not even something that's insignificant. It's the timer. A timer is something that's very significant to the game. You gotta take timers, you gotta understand timing in general, and it's a, it's a really big part of the game, so separating that is, is really stupid. Um, if, you wanna, if you wanna let them know, please let them know that this needs to be changed, and uh, this is not a really good idea for them to move something so important away from the, the key portion of the HUD that, that, that they wanted to, you know, they wanted all the focus to be on the bottom side, yet for some reason, they moved it away. But that's the HUD update. Uh, I think it's pretty cool. I, I've had some time to adjust to it because I, I play on PvE quite often, and while I don't want to say that I'm completely used to it yet, I'm still not used to it, but give it some time and it'll probably grow on you. It's, it's not that bad. Now, uh, more importantly, let's talk about some of the changes in this patch, starting with Gangplank. Gangplank was reworked. As you can see, he got a champion update, not only a visual update, but a gameplay update as well. And uh, you can't see it on your screen, but as always, I like to try and um, like write down notes and talk about specific things. So I'm just going to go over his kit in general, uh, if you want to follow along with it. His new passive is Trial by Fire. His basic attacks ignite the target and deal bonus true damage over time and grant some movement speed. When he destroys a Powder Keg, which is his E ability, his new E, it resets this passive and grants move speed. Uh, but otherwise, it's set. It's on a set cooldown of 15 seconds. His new passive is a lot cooler than the old one. Uh, previously, his passive, it was either really, really terrible or really annoyingly oppressive in other cases. And the latter is because he could stack it with using his Q, his Parley. parley. Um, this version of the passive, he actually has to auto-attack to trigger it. He can't actually use his Q to trigger it. Um, that means that his threat in, in the melee range is actually increased, while his threat 
poking with Q, his parlay is actually a little bit weaker now. Now, about his Q, um, like most of his kits, I would say it's relatively unchanged. He just, what his Q does, parlay, fires his pistol, deals damage, applies on hit effects that are not as passive, and it can crit. If he kills a unit, he gets refunded half the mana cost, and he gains gold. Now, the new feature he gets is whenever he kills a unit with parlay, he doesn't just get gold, he gets a new currency called Silver Serpents. Now, this currency is a unique currency to Gangplank, and you use it to upgrade his ultimate, as I will get into later. His W removes scurvy, also relatively unchanged. He still chomps an orange and makes everything K, but the base heal was significantly reduced, and now, uh, to make up for that, the heal has been... another type of heal has been added, and that's percent missing health heal. So when he's at lower current HP values, when he's at like a third HP, or when he just has a lot of total health, and uh, like a lot of health in general, 3-4k health if you're building tank on him, then remove scur scurvy will become a lot stronger than it used to be. You get a lot more heal because it's a percent health heal. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later, once I get into an overall analysis of his abilities. But let's move on to his E. His E is Powder Keg. It's completely different now. Uh, Ray's morale was removed in favor of Powder Keg. Uh, Gangplank stores Powder Kegs and is able to drop them at a target location. If he hits a keg while the keg is at 1 HP, uh, it starts with 3 HP and it decays over time. Then the, then the uh, keg explodes, deals damage, and it slows everything around it. The damage of the keg is based off of the damage of the attack that was used to detonate the keg. So if he auto attacks it, then it deals damage to everything around the keg uh, based on his auto attack damage. If he uses parlay to last hit it, uh, then it detonates it with more damage. Um, also, if he uses parlay, then he gets gold whenever a unit is killed by the explosion. So basically you can think of powder keg as it applies on hit effects to some extent, um, because I guess I should say it applies on hit damage and it applies his Q's on hit effect from the Q itself. That's more specific. Um, if an enemy last hits the keg, then it gets destroyed and does nothing. So because the decay is pretty rapid, both you and the enemy can time your attacks to make the keg explode. That means that in some cases it's kind of like a 50-50, but if you time it correctly, you can make it so Gangplank's kegs don't do anything at all. And that's the counterplay to it. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting counterplay, I would say. Now, the other thing about Powder Keg is that you can connect the kegs together. You can hold up to five kegs. The amount of kegs you can hold is based on his ultimate rank. So at level 16, once you get a rank 3 ultimate, you can hold up to 5 kegs, but by default you have 2 only before level 6. Um, you can connect these 2 kegs together, they have a, a range indicator around them, and if the 2 kegs are within that range indicator, if they overlap, then uh, I think it's like a, a trail of gunpowder connects the 2. So what happens is, if you detonate one of the kegs, the other one also detonates after uh, the gunpowder trail is lit ablaze and it reaches the other keg. So you can think of it as kind of connect the dots. When you connect the dots together, uh, the explosion chains from keg to keg and it potentially covers the entire screen if you have enough kegs at the, at the later levels, like after level 11 and 16. Um, but the thing with the damage is that it doesn't apply damage per keg, it applies damage once only. So you can't just stack all the kegs in one area and make them detonate. Um, it's better to spread them out and make them chain across the screen because the explosion only deals damage once and damage is set no matter what. So for this ability, um, it's a little bit clunky to use. It's really fun um, and it's really good if you plan ahead, but it's still a little, a little bit clunky because it's, it's kind of slow. Before the rework, one of Gangplank's biggest weaknesses was his lack of wave clear. You'd have to buy something like Iceborne Gauntlet or Static Shiv or both of them in order to actually have Wave Clear, or Tiamat, I guess, uh, Tiamat Hydra, to give himself Wave Clear. Now he doesn't really need to do that because he basically has a built in uh, Hydra on his E. You just throw down a keg, you detonate it with your auto attack or with your Q, and then it creates this Wave Clear option for you. 
Uh, so this is this fixes that, and it also kind of makes Gangplank a little harder to play. You have to really know how to use Powder Keg well, but if you use it well, he can be ridiculously strong. At max rank, Powder Keg slows for 80%. It's, it's really insane. It slows for 80%, it, it ignores armor on enemies' hits, um, and it also has a base bonus value against enemy champions. So not only does it have great utility, but it has consistently good damage as well. If you're planning to pick up Gangplank, you really need to practice how to use this ability, because otherwise he's just the same old uh, Q-spamming pirate as before. But, you know, this is this update actually makes him more than that. He has, he has a lot more to him than just Q-spamming and occasionally using his E to boost damage or whatever. He's a lot more interactive, he's a lot more fun, and he can potentially be a lot more stronger if you use him well. And finally, let's talk about his ultimate. Uh, Cannon Barrage, same thing. Um, it's a global ultimate that fires cannonballs at a target location and it slows the enemies that get hit. Uh, like I said earlier, there's a passive portion that increases the amount of kegs he can carry, and there's also a new feature in that you can technically you can think of it as an evolution. Think of it like Vixer or Kha'Zix, except it only affects one ability instead of affecting all of the abilities. Um, he Gangplank evolves. Evolve is kind of a weird word. Let's just use the word upgrade. Gangplank upgrades his ultimate using those serpents that he gets from last hitting with his parlay. Uh, it costs 500 serpents, silver serpents, to upgrade either Death's Daughter, Raise Morale, or Fire at Will. These are the names of the three upgrades. And what these upgrades do, Death's Daughter gives him a giant cannonball shot at the center of the AoE which deals true damage and has a massive slow. Raise Morale increases the movement speed of allies that walk through it. Fire at Will increases the fire rate of the cannonball waves, adding six more waves of cannonballs to the ability overall. Once you get all three of these upgrades, you can upgrade all of them. Gangplank's ultimate becomes ridiculously strong. He, he does, uh, he fires out, I think, 18 waves of cannonballs that slow. The middle deals bonus true damage that also slows even more, and allies that walk through it, or allies that fight inside of it, you could just fight inside of it. Think of it like a, a zone of combat. It's, it's pretty crazy. You have, you have a lot of slow, a lot of uh, a haste, and a lot of damage. So he has a potential to be a very, very powerful team fighter now. A lot more than before. Um, the old game playing his ultimate was pretty strong in team fights. If you actually sat inside the ultimate, it dealt a lot of magic damage, and the slow was very, very nice. Now it's it's even better than that if you can upgrade it with silver serpents. So for the overall look at Gangplank, uh, his old his rework is definitely a lot better than the old Gangplank. He's definitely a lot stronger. Some of the base values are a little bit lower than before. That's to be expected because his scaling and his damage potential are a lot higher now, as well as his versatility. I guess he he's a lot more versatile. He can be played in many different ways, and you can play him more creatively than before. Before it was just, well, I'm going to queue you, right? That's it. Now it's like, am I going to queue you? Am I going to queue the, the powder keg? How am I going to set up the powder kegs? Um, when do I want to use my oranges? Because it has a pretty long cooldown. If I use it too early, I don't get a big of a, as big of a heal. If I use it too late, then maybe I'll just die, even though it does heal me more. So you have to make these more intelligent decisions. It's not just flat value this, flat value that. It's, it's really situational, conditional, and dependent on how the game is being played and uh, how people are playing in general. You can, you, you can play more reactively now um, because you have more versatility to the character. You're not just Q spamming anymore. Your, your kid is a lot more than that. And because of that, uh, you can do so much more, so many different things with Gangplank. Now, as for his playstyle, his playstyle is still pretty similar to before. Uh, you max Q, now this is what I wanted to talk about earlier with his W. You max Q first, but you max E second now instead of W. Before you used to max W second because Raise Morale was a pretty garbage ability. It didn't really give you that much, it was a one point wonder. Um, but the one point actually gives you, or it actually gave you a pretty good amount of stats, so it's okay to leave it at level one. Now, 
you're going to leave your W at level 1. You're going to leave uh, Remove Scurvy at level 1. And the reason is because the flat heal increase per level is really, really bad. But the percent missing health heal, it's consistent at all levels. So you still get a strong heal by, by not even ranking it up. You just keep it at rank 1 and you just you get that 15% missing health heal. And um, from my experience, the W at level 1 can heal you for about 250 HP, even at lower levels, if you use it while you're low HP. So 250 HP is quite a lot. It's equivalent to like a level 3 version of his uh, of the old Gangplank's Remove Scurvy. And it's just a 1-point wonder. Um, it's pretty crazy what you can do with it. And of course, obviously, it also removes CC effects. Um, so that's 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 always going to be there. Oranges are good, right? Oranges make you cave. Um, for playstyle, um, you still Q to harass. Uh, but now you can E for wave clear and harass. This means that he can be played in any role just like before, but I think he still just works best as a mid laner or a top laner. Uh, Powder Keg gives him that nice AoE for jungling as well, so that's always an option. Uh, basically, you can still play him anywhere, but I still think it's better to play him as a DPS role. Um, I, I guess I should say the key difference in his playstyle is that you have to make use of the EQ mechanic to farm gold and serpents. If you don't use your Q on the Keg to farm silver serpents, it takes a long time to get your cannon upgrades, and you don't want that. You want to get your cannon upgrades as fast as possible. Um, being able to upgrade your, your ultimate is extremely important because, uh, as you probably realized from the descriptions of the upgrades, they're really good upgrades. And if you get all three really fast, um, you probably can't get them really fast, obviously. But if you get them in general, maybe like 40 minutes in the game, you have all three of them. Maybe even like 30 minutes in the game if you're really good at farming, then you're going to have a huge, huge power spike on your ultimate. So, like I said, you can play him basically anywhere, but for all intents and purposes, Gangplank is still a DPS character. You can get away with building tank on him, you can play him as a support if you want, but he's not maximizing his stats. He has that 80% slow on his Powder Keg, uh, which means that he can work pretty well as a tank or a support, but he still works best when you combo him with another tank. Uh, you need someone that can like hard CC for you and you can DPS them. Um, in the end of the day, it, he should still be a DPS character, with maybe a little bit of tanky stats, because he is melee after all. I think that he'll be quite strong, I think that, uh, especially because his team fighting is going to be a lot better with the powder kegs, even though they're a little bit clunky, and we might see some quality of life changes to them, they do make him overall better, and on top of that he also has his ultimate that can be upgraded, so he's going to be a very strong team fighter compared to before, and that is why I think we'll probably see some play. If not, if not because he just got reworked, he's fresh. He's a fresh new champion, people are interested. Um, he will probably see play because he's actually strong. Alright, so the next champion, the uh, not gameplay update champion, but visual update champion, is Misfortune. She received some changes to her kit, but not nearly as much as Gangplank, who basically got an overhaul of his entire kit. Uh, so what happened with Misfortune, she looks a little better now, and her Q double up, it deals bonus damage. If it kills the first unit instead, um, it deals 150% bonus damage. It deals 100% damage, I should say, instead of 120% on the second hit. Um, but she has to kill a unit now. She has to actually uh, kill the minion. So if you, if you bounce it off a minion to harass, you can't just like bounce it off straight up and hit the champion, because then you won't deal much damage at all. It has to kill the minion to become empowered. And if it does get empowered, you can think of these hits as kind of mini crits. Um, double up already deals a good amount of damage, so increasing that even more, it feels like you just got crit. You get chunked really hard, so you gotta be really careful against Misfortune. If you're playing her, well that's fun, because you're gonna be removing a lot of health from your enemies in an instant. Second ability is uh, her W in Pure Shots. No longer applies grievous wounds, uh, and the activation of this ability not only does it give you attack speed, but it also resets her passive move speed bonus. So if you use this intelligently, then you can actually um, reactivate your passive after you lose it in combat and become more mobile. 
but it still feels a little bit weird. It's kind of clunky the way it's 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 like this. Uh, I think that it should be like Teemo's passive, Teemo's uh, move quick passive, where if you if you get hit, uh, it removes it, but if you activate it, then it just stays for the duration. I don't I don't really agree with this kind of change. I think that in the future maybe it'll be changed, but uh, until then, this is all we have right now. And on top of that, uh, the cooldown goes down. Four second less cooldown means that you can activate impure shots more, and that means that she can have her attack speed steroid up more, as well as reset her passive more. That's basically it. Uh, and the final change, uh, Misfortune's E, her Make It Rain, it now slows more consistently at lower levels. Instead of starting at 25%, it starts at 40%, but it goes up to 60% only instead of 65%. She loses the 5% slow at max rank, but she gets an overall better slow in general with this ability. You don't really max this ability anyway, you max QW on Misfortune, and leaving this at level 1 now actually gives up 40% slow for a couple seconds if they stay inside the, the AoE, so it's actually significantly more powerful than before. Um, as for Misfortune in general, she's not actually that different. She already had a decent laning phase, she had decent harass, decent damage. Um, her problem was transitioning into the mid to late game, she doesn't really scale that well, her damage is not that great. She does a lot of mixed damage, uh, but she's still primarily built as a physical damage dealer, so it's not like Corky where you have a ton of magic damage. Uh, she has some magic damage only, and it's not that great. Uh, as for her Q, obviously that's different now, you're going to be wanting to use that to last hit, and then bounce it on the enemy champion. So that's probably the only thing that's different really in her in her laning phase, uh, and that actually makes her laning phase stronger because you get these kind of mini crits on her Q as, instead of just dealing a little bit of bonus damage. I don't think she's going to be played too often. Um, I still think that the best AD carries right now are Callista and Tristana, maybe Ash and Corky. Those ones, they're, they're still really good AD carries that Misfortune doesn't really match up well against. Uh, I think she has a little more power now in her kit to deal with those champions, but she's still a little bit inferior to them. Alright, this patch actually isn't very big, so let's just zoom through it. A lot of the previous patches uh, have been kind of long, especially the 5.13 one, which is kind of tiring. Alright, so Ari Charm no longer causes minions, uh, monsters to freak out, regen, or otherwise act unnaturally. So what this means is that she can uh, take blue buff easier now if she's charming. Um, she can actually integrate charm into her ability rotation against blue buff, and she won't make a reset and heal, and kind of annoy the jungler as well as herself. That's basically it. It just makes her a little bit better at killing blue. Azir. Uh, Azir is getting some pretty big changes. The passive Will of the Emperor no longer exists. He no longer gains attack speed based on Azir's cooldown reduction. Now he gets attack speed uh, based on the level of his W. He gets up to 60% attack speed, which is basically the same as um, the passive before. You got, I think it was 1.5% attack speed for every cooldown reduction, so with 40% cooldown reduction, you got 60% attack speed. That's, that's going to be the same, except he gets it earlier now in most cases. Um, usually Azir doesn't get 40% cooldown reduction until the later stages of the game. Um, past level 9 at least, I would say. Uh, maybe even up to like level 14, 15. That's when you start getting a lot of a huge chunk of cooldown reduction. Um, so he's going to get more attack speed early on, so he's going to be a bit stronger early on. He's still going to be very good as that late game hyper carry AP marksman. But the E change is the big one. Shifting Sands no longer knocks up the first enemy champion hit. So what this does is, when he dashes in with it, when he tries to do the uh, Azir sec by, by pushing the enemy into your team, he's no longer going to be as safe. He no longer disables the enemy with the knockup in order to actually um, set himself up to, to make that play. Um, what this does is, it removes that CC from him, obviously. Azir is a control mage with a lot of CC, and this is just one less CC for him to use. Which means that he's probably going to be more... He's still going to do this, I think. Um, the initiation, but it's going to be more... It's going to be less reliable, it's not going to be as good as it used to be, because one of the disables is now gone. 
and he's going to be uh, more of that AP marksman in the late game more than anything else, and, and a little bit of a poke champion, I guess. So overall, Azir is not going to change that much. It's only the, the times where he actually tries to make a play that's when it's going to change. This is going to affect not only his team fights and skirmishes, but also his dueling in lane. If he ease into the enemy, sure he still gains the shield, but he doesn't disable the enemy and get a he basically gets a free auto attack or two off when that disable happens. He doesn't get that anymore, so that means the enemy will be able to counterattack much more appropriately. And he's going to try and, I guess, poke people more than before, um, and before he actually goes all in. And I guess that's the biggest change in his playstyle. I still think that Azir is going to be a pretty strong champion. Um, maybe not like top two. For the last couple of patches, he's been top two alongside Victor. Victor and Azir have been like the gods of mid lane, basically. Um, and now, maybe not. Maybe because he doesn't duel as well, because his laning is a little bit weaker, uh, and because he no longer has that passive, which I think is really stupid. Um, I think that his passive was one of the cooler passives in the game, because it had item synergy. You build items, and you got attack speed from it, even though the item only gave cooldown reduction. So, like, I guess that's something that Riot didn't want in the game, at least not at the moment. Um, I thought it was really cool. It's not here anymore. Um, overall, Azir is still good. Their game, their champion, they can do what they want, right? Uh, he, he's still going to be a pretty good champion. So Darius. Darius's E Apprehend now gives vision of the area around the pull when he uses it. It's just a little quality of life change. Darius is still this low mobility tank with really mediocre tank tools, and he falls off really hard in the mid to late game. He's going to need a rework, I think, before he can actually see some play. He's just like this low elo brute forcing pub stomper. That's what he's good at, and that's all he's really good at, unfortunately. All right, so Echo. I'm probably going to talk about him again a lot. Um, I'll start off by saying, what is this? Echo is getting buffed? Why? Like, why is he getting buffed? I, I know that Riot is crazy now. Um, sometimes, well, usually I should say, not, not sometimes, most of the time they make very intelligent changes. Uh, even though I may not agree with all of them, I think that overall the changes are good for the game. But what is this? Basically, what they're saying here is... I'm going to read off this part. Um, Alright, I'll start off here then. Basically, building tons of damage and smacking people into next seasons not as rewarding as grabbing a Cinder Hulk and CCing the entire team with impunity. While we're not directly addressing that here, we're first looking to bring up his baseline level of power for the DPS build of Echo, basically. Alright, so, and I guess the, the last part, I should, I should probably say that too, before evaluating how to bring Tank Echo in line. So basically what they're saying is that Echo is being played too much outside of his intended role, which is the mid lane assassin, so we're going to buff his numbers, so he gets played more in his intended role. Wait, what? Are you serious? Like, really? When you buff numbers... He's not going to get played in his intended role. What are you talking about? If you buff these numbers specifically, when you buff mana costs to cost less and you lower cooldowns, these changes don't make him a better assassin. These changes make him a better tank as much as it makes him a better assassin. All they're doing is buffing Echo in general. Echo, any build of Echo, 80 carry Echo is better now because of this. These changes don't address the problem that they're claiming to address. You're not, you're not directly addressing. You're not addressing it at all. Even this is not how you address this kind of change, uh, this kind of balancing feature. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. Lowering the mana cost will allow him to use his abilities more. Lowering the cooldown on phase dive lets him be more mobile. Okay, the mana cost maybe, maybe it's a it's an appropriate buff for Assassin Echo. It's a pretty expensive ability. But the cooldown reduction, why? 
why is the cooldown reduction being considered as a possible buff for Assassin Echo? Let's take a look at the stats for Echo here. All right, so Echo has 400 and, uh, 340 move speed, which is way above average. Uh, that's the Assassin Fighter tier of move speed. He has a 40% slow and haste on his passive, and on top of that, he has two slows on his Q and his W as well, as well as a 2.5 second AoE stun. These are all mobility related, either his own mobility or relative mobility, in that he disables the enemy so that they're less mobile than him. So it's not like he's lacking mobility. This is the reason why he's being played as a jungler with Cinder Hulk. He's so mobile and sticky that he gets off a respectable damage just by sticking next to you, so Cinder Hulk becomes more powerful that way. Assassin Echo, if you're talking about damage overall, Assassin Echo is still by far the most powerful version of Echo. Still. That that's never that has never changed. But the thing is, who cares about damage when you have such high number values? Like this kind of stuff, numbers. This kind of stuff, numbers. Um, the other stuff I was talking about, the slow, 80% slow, 2.25 second AoE stun, those are numbers. These are high number values. His base damages and his base values are good enough so he has a lot of damage without building damage and he has a lot of utility. These changes here don't address any of the problems that Echo has. In fact, they even state that they're not addressing the issue, so why not? Why are they not addressing this issue here? Instead, they're, they're apparently addressing the baseline power of Echo's DPS builds. Like Normally, I would agree with a lot of Riot's changes because they, they do know pretty well. They know their game pretty well. They know the direction of the game a lot better than the public does. Um, even if there's a vocal minority, minority who are in disagreement. And, but the thing is, this is one of those cases where they're just straight up wrong. The baseline power for Echo's DPS build is apparently mana costs and cooldown reduction. Like, what is this? This is not the baseline level of power for Echo's DPS build. This is not it. Do you know what is? If you want more power on DPS Echo, you raise his ratios and lower his base damages. That's how you do it. That's how, that's how you balance Echo. That's how you balance a champion who you want to scale better, who wants to you know, build more damage in general and scale better off the damage. These buffs are stat buffs that all versions of Echo enjoy, so you're not addressing the DPS version of Echo. Now here's the issue. This is the big underlying issue with Echo. You can't buff his ratios. You can't buff his ratios. Do you see the problem now? I hope you can understand this. Echo's AP ratios on his abilities are ridiculously high. If you buffed his AP ratios even more than they already are at, then he'll be completely broken. He's going to have AP ratios that are just through the roof. Um, his ultimate already has a 1.3 AP ratio. If you buff that to like 2.0, that, that's just stupid. If you buff his Q, the, the Q already got a, a ratio nerf, so... Uh, like last patch or the, the patch before that, he lost some damage on his his Q ratio. So the baseline power of Echo's DPS build, you actually nerfed that in a previous patch. So what's going on here? Cinder Hulk Echo didn't build a lot of AP, so if you nerf AP ratios, it doesn't get weaker. Do you see the problem here? I really hope that you can see the problem here because this is a huge problem. Echo is a champion with a slow and clunky kit as an assassin. On top of that, assassins in general are just not as good as they used to be. Most assassins have fallen out of the meta, and if you ignore the meta, most assassins have received number nerfs that have made them weaker than they used to be. So it's not just a perceived weakness, it's an actual statistical weakness. I said that I said this when Echo was released. Um, when, he, when he came out, his downfall will be his clunky kit, his slow and clunky kit, because as an assassin you need to have a very fast and flowing kit. But his numbers are so high, that's why he's still being played. And this is the reason why he's being played in other roles, because his numbers are so good. He got some nerfs, which made his slow and clunky kit even more difficult to play. And this is why players started to distance themselves from this, 
from this champion. Um, they're going back to similar champions like Fizz in Nidalee, who do very similar things, but they have much faster and much better flowing kits, but their numbers are by far lower. Fizz in Nidalee, their ratios, their base values are much lower than Echo's values. Echo is the perfect example of a champion who's conceptually flawed in terms of playability. The way you play him is flawed. He's an assassin who doesn't play like an assassin, and that's, that's an issue. Um, he's not just hard to play, it's hard to feel rewarded when playing him unless he just face rolls you, he just stomps all over you. His Q has to be perfect, um, his, his passive requires three melee auto attacks to trigger the slow slash haste. He has to land his W perfectly to make it stun, um, but even if he doesn't, he still shields himself and it still slows initially. Uh, he has to land his ultimate perfectly to deal damage. So the problem here is that three of those four abilities that I listed, they have massive, massive numbers. And the numbers is what makes them really great to land. It feels good to land those number, the, those abilities because the numbers are so high. The disparity between risk versus reward is huge. If you miss, you miss this super inflated base value plus a massive AP ratio and a really powerful CC. If you hit the enemy, the enemy explodes. You can't have this degree of disparity in the, in the champion's kit. Risk versus reward is great, but it can't be this huge of a difference. There's nothing wrong at the moment with Assassin Echo. In terms of his damage, in terms of what he does, he dodges skill shots with two of his abilities, he's hyper mobile, he's very strong, his damage is really high, but the problem itself is the kit. The kit itself is the problem with Echo. He needs faster animations, or he needs his mechanics to be looked at, he needs different mechanics. Um, he needs his power shifted from base stats to ratios, so when people don't build offensive stats that work off those ratios, they're left with mediocre damage at best, and perhaps even mediocre utility at best, if they do do uh, change the utility aspects to scale with AP. I think that Riot has done a really good job at balancing champions this way in the past. Ari is a really good example of this. Uh, they lowered her base values and they buffed her ratios. Akali, same thing. On top of that, both of these champions, they had kind of functionality, usability buffs. Uh, Ari gets move speed whenever she uses her Q, and her Foxfire is less clunky. Its priority is a little bit better, and it um, hits more reliably. Akali, uh, I guess this part is gone, rip, but she used to be able to pop her, her Q marks with her E, um, and it did make her feel really good when that feature was in-game. And uh, on top of that, her Shroud, her, her W, it gives move speed, so she felt more ninja-like to play. She just felt better overall to play. Both of these champions were weakened in terms of raw power, but their kits, their playstyle, and the flow of their abilities felt better. Why is it so hard to implement these kinds of changes on Echo? I, I'm not sure. It's, it's very similar. The, these champions are very similar um, in terms of like the way you approach them in, in, for balancing. Is Riot really scared of the community backlash when you, let's say, reduce his passive move speed buff to half or even one third of the slow? And you, slow them you slow them by 80 percent and you only gain like 25 percent of that um as as a haste it is riot scared of speeding up the q projectile speed while lowering the base damage of it at early levels is riot scared of changing his w stun into a 1.25 second stun at all ranks um, but it also gains an additional one second slow after the stun ends you still get a 2.25 second disable you just get a less powerful one uh, and a less oppressive one in the most optimal cases. These are potential changes that Echo will have in the future, I think anyway. Um, these are good approaches, I believe, and in line with the way Riot used to balance, or did balance, champions of this caliber before. The community complained about how ridiculous his numbers were when Echo was released. Riot stood their ground, and now the time has come for Echo to be looked at better. I think they're starting to realize that they need to change them fundamentally to do so, um, to continue to, to preserve a healthy balancing style, to 
preserve like healthy gameplay in general. Um, the problem is that it involves nerfing him. He has to be nerfed even more. And at the moment, community percep perception is that he's weak. And if you nerf a perceived weak champion, you will get greeted with huge backlash. And I think this is something that Riot might be scared of. But it's reached a point where it has to happen. For Echo to be realistically balanced in the future and be along the same lines as the other champions, he's going to have to get nerfed or reworked. And it's really, really hard to say this, I guess, because he's a new champion and he's already being um, looked at in this way, which is not a good thing. It means that he has a fundamental flaw. So that's that's basically my my input on Echo. It's He's a champion that is a kind of oddity. He's a very strong champion, except nobody thinks he's strong. But, you know, once he gets nerfed, people will realize that uh, you gotta appreciate what you had before and not take it for granted. And, and that's basically Echo in a nutshell, for the last while even, and especially after this patch, when they buffed him for no apparent reason. Moving on, moving on. Elise. Elise is getting big buffs. Cocoon lasts for longer. The stun duration lasts for longer at lower ranks. Much longer at lower ranks. 0.6 seconds more at level 1. Um, and it normalizes back to 2 seconds at level... I guess level 18. Probably don't want to max a second now because the stun is so long. Um, so what this does is it gives her a lot of early game power. Um, and it gives her more of that early aggression style that Elise should have. It means that she's more in line with champions like Lee Sin and Nidalee. On top of that, uh, she's getting some changes to her spider form. Her spider leans do magic damage instead of physical damage, and they have a higher AP ratio as well. Uh, also, their move speed now matches Elise's move speed while she's in spider form, the 355 move speed. And finally, the bug fix. There's a bug fix where the spider leans um, there's a bug, there was a bug, where the spiderlings wouldn't do anything for 4 seconds after Elise used Rappel, and I guess that got changed. So with the last patch, Elise got some pretty good changes, mostly to her sustain. Uh, it made her clear time a little, made her clear a little bit healthier, um, and, and it kind of let her go crazy early. It allowed her to gank more, allowed her to apply more pressure on the enemy jungler as well as on the lanes. So she was already pretty good last patch. With these changes, she's going to be able to go crazy even more in the early game. The 1.6 second stun is insanely good. At no point has at least ever had a 1.6 second stun at rank 1. The, the duration used to be uh, 1.5 seconds, but this is 1.6 seconds, and it scales up instead of being consistently 1.5 at all ranks. So. This might be enough to push her over the edge. I, I, I think that she's going to be at least in line with, with the champions like Lee Sin and Nidalee. Uh, Nidalee especially is being played the most at the moment as a jungler. She's like the top priority jungler at the moment. And I think that this puts her in line very close. Maybe not the same in terms of damage as Nidalee, but definitely in terms of utility, especially when considering that new stun. Uh, the Spiderlings doing magic damage is also important because it means that they're going to be doing more damage overall. Especially if you go AP at least jungle. Um, if not AP, then some kind of hybrid build with tanky stats, as well as some magic pen. Uh, making AP, this is actually going to make AP at least more of a viable option as well, so you can go Runeglaive on her, uh, and you'll get more damage overall. Not only are you going to be getting more damage from the ratio, but because you're going to be pairing her up with items that give her magic pen, she's going to deal more damage with her spiderlings as well. Uh, on top of all of that, magic damage is a, little, is a little bit harder to mitigate in the early game, especially for junglers. A lot of them forego getting magic resist for either cooldown reduction or offensive stats in their glyphs. Um, even if they don't, even if they go standard, um, they're still going to be more armor focused in general. So magic resist is just a little bit stronger than the early game, and it's a little bit more easier. It's a little easier to mitigate in the mid game. So I guess that could be a potential weakness as well. So that's Elise. Um, basically, I think that she's going to be pretty good now. She's, she's already a pretty good champion, and this is going to make her even better. And I think that's a really cool change, because Elise is a really fun champion with a high skill cap. If you play her well, she's really good. If you don't play her well, she sucks. And that's the kind of champion that um, I think people should be 
playing more. These are the kinds of champions that people should be playing more because it's more interesting that way. Because she has so much outplay potential on both ends, because her skill cap is much higher than a lot of the other junglers in the game, uh, maybe not as high as, let's say, Nidalee or Lee Sin, but still close. Um, she's a really healthy champion, really fun champion to play. Alright, Evelyn is receiving some nerfs to her Q. The base damage is going to be weaker at later levels. She's still going to maintain that 40 damage at level 1, so her early clear is not getting gutted. Um, her early clear was buffed before because it was so terrible, uh, and that's what made her a little bit more viable. People start playing her more, uh, and this won't affect her too much. I guess she'll be a little bit weaker after level 3, level, level 9, I guess. Um, once you start ranking up the ability, but she's still going to be pretty good. At level 6, she'll be getting a stronger slow. She'll be getting 10% more slow per rank on her ultimate. Um, so her initiations, her ganks, they're going to be a little bit better even though she's going to deal less damage. So that's Evelyn. Not, not too much to her. Um, she's still a pretty strong jungler. Maybe not the best jungler, maybe not even top 3, maybe not even top 5. But she's still considered as a pretty good jungler because she has that stealth to her, and she can really surprise you in the early game. Callista's abilities now queue up properly after she uses a basic attack. Um, there's not really too much to talk about here. I believe there was some delay on the, on her abilities. That's why uh, this change is, is now in game, and that's basically it. You're going to feel her abilities flowing a little bit better after her uh, basic attacks now. Rumble's getting some bug fixes. Riot is also keeping an eye on him. Um, I think this is because the AP itemization changes in 5.13 made Rumble a lot stronger. His core items, Leandri's, Rylai's, Zanya's Hourglass, um, they were all, I guess two of the three were buffed and Zanya's Hourglass was made a little bit cheaper. Um, so basically, he's a lot stronger now after the patch. And like obviously, if you if you buff his core, if you buff, buff his core items, he's just going to be overall better. Um, he's still one of the strongest top laners in the game, and I think that we'll probably see nerfs in the future. Um, but until then, he can no longer damage untargetable enemies and enemies outside of his range. Good fixes, good bug fixes. That was ridiculous. All right, Rise is getting some more number nerfs. His passive stack duration is now six seconds down from ten seconds which means he has to spend more mana to constantly refresh it if he wants to keep his passive up. Uh, his Q and E damage are going down as well, so his overall burst is going to be a lot weaker. All of those people who complained about Ryze when he was initially released, the rework of him, they're looking pretty foolish now, I think. His numbers are now officially lower than they have ever been since the rework. The, these are the lowest numbers that he has ever had. And guess what? He's still going to be played. Because he's Rise. Because he's still good. Because he's annoying to play against. Because he has that near perma root. That's just what Rise is. That's just how Rise is as a champion. And yeah, those people look pretty foolish now. The ones that kept saying, no, he's terrible. Awful rework. I'm going to judge things immediately without actually understanding it. I'm going to play like one game of Rise and think that he's bad because I built a frozen heart on him instead of building a MAP. People that don't understand the champion making these conclusions about the champion. It's pretty foolish. Next champion on the list, Tom Kench. Last patch is when Tom Kench came out. Um, he's a pretty strong champion, especially when he can coordinate well with your team. But he's kind of clunky and his numbers are, were a little bit weak. At least his Q was. So um, I actually said that I thought that his W and her E were pretty good. Um, but... His other parts of his kit, I guess, were a little bit weak. And I guess Riot has had the same sentiment about it. Um, his Q and his ultimate are getting buffed. He's getting higher base damage on his Tongue Lash and higher bonus damage ratio on his alt passive, the uh, bonus health ratio that deals on hit damage for, for him. Um, oh, additionally, yeah, the, the cooldown was also lower at lower, uh, early ranks. So level 1 and 2, um, it's no longer... 160 seconds, near 3 minute cooldown um, at level 1, which which means that he can actually make some more plays now. 
Um, he can make more early game plays, and he's just going to be more of a threat in the early game compared to the later portions of the game. Um, after these changes, I think he'll be in a pretty good spot. He may receive a few more buffs, such as uh, a slower decay on his passive, uh, or some other lower end changes. Uh, when his passive decays, it decays pretty rapidly. Uh, it's like you keep the stacks there for a couple seconds, and then after those couple seconds, it's like tick, 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 and then it's gone. Uh, maybe they'll slow that down. His E may also get nerfed. Uh, I think his E is pretty ridiculous right now. He can almost double his HP. But uh, aside from that, I think that's basically it for Tom Ketch. Um, he's still a good champion. He's good when you play him well, and that's not going to change at all. Vayne is getting a little bit of a change on her tumble. The tumble's cooldown begins upon launching the attack instead of um, upon hitting the target. It's just a quality of life change that, that makes her cooldown come up slightly faster, and there's nothing much more to that. Um, as for Vayne overall, she's still a decent champion if you're mechanically strong and you're against at least, let's say, two to three tanky champions. Um, and if not, then she's pretty awful. She needs a lot of babysitting to be good, and she needs a lot of time to be good. But that's that's what a hyper carry is, right? Yasuo's Q3 applies on hit on hit effects correctly now. So Steel Tempest now affects uh, the Whirlwind on the third Steel Tempest now gives him on hit effects properly. It's it's a bug fix, and I think it's a great change um, to make him more consistent. But to talk about Yasuo overall, I guess, like, I just want to add in these kinds of little extra comments because it does make sense to make a comment about them. Um, Yasuo is actually really strong right now. He may actually get nerfed in the near future um, because at the moment, it, it's, he's meta strong, I'll say that. Uh, there's a lot of poke champions at the moment that are really strong, uh, and Yasuo does pretty well against these poke champions. He can, he can be an anti-siege champion, and he has amazing follow-up to hard engage, which is really strong against poke champions, but that's the reason why he's so powerful. And that's uh, that's basically it for the champions for this patch. Now let's get into the fun stuff, the really really cool stuff. Items. Hunter's Machete is getting a little more mana regen while you're in combat with monsters. Uh, instead of 3 mana per second, it's now 4 mana per second, so it's a pretty big change because it's per second. This helps with champions with uh, weaker early clears. Uh, a lot more than it does with champions that do really well early. And it also doesn't affect mana-less champions, obviously. There are several mana-less champions who jungle decently well. Lee Sin and Rengar come to mind. I guess Riven as well, if you do play her. And I think those champions, they shouldn't be touched at the moment, especially buffed. So these kinds of changes to Hunter's Machete will help tanks a little bit. Tanks that like to spam a lot, have high mana costs. Um, as well as AP champions that may be a little bit awful in the early game, which most of them are, except Nidalee and Elise. Runeglaive. Runeglaive is being changed, finally. This is probably, I would say this is probably one of the bigger changes in the patch, um, especially because Runeglaive has been such a huge problem in the last couple weeks. It no longer converts your auto attack damage to magic damage, and that's huge. Um, and not only that, the AoE only applies on monsters now instead of minions and champions. So that's also really huge. You can say goodbye to Lane Rune Glaive pretty much entirely. Uh, goodbye to AP Ezreal. No one will miss you. No one. Toxic champion with Rune Glaive. Uh, and basically, he's not going to get played anymore. Unless you just like AP Ezreal. Uh, but if you do play AP Ezreal, he's going to be a lot weaker than before. Now that Rune Glaive is specifically a jungle item, since it can't be used to uh, apply on lane minions anymore, it's going to be used a lot less. Um, there's not that many AP junglers that use Rune Glaive effectively, so because of that, the item you're going to see a lot less, um, and you're only going to see it on specific champions that are already being jungled, like Elise and Nidalee. Uh, in team fights, champions that do pick up Rune Glaive, they're not going to get much out of it. Runeblade basically does nothing in team fights except give you AP and CDR, so it's a really terrible team fight item. It's actually probably the worst team fight item out of all the jungler items now, just because it doesn't apply on anything but monsters. Now the cool thing about 
this change, the changes in this patch, is that it deals double damage to the first monster hit. Um, so the magic damage is no longer being, uh, the auto attack damage no longer being transformed into magic damage. It's going to overall be weaker on champions that build AP because they build magic pen, they like having magic damage, and the magic damage synergizes well with uh, their kit and their itemization. Now that they're not going to get that, they can they get this compensation. They deal double damage to the first monster hit. So not only will they have a lot of single target damage, but they're also going to have a lot of AoE damage as well. They already had AoE damage before, uh, and now they have single target damage to make up for the fact that they're going to be dealing less damage with the auto attacks in general. I think that with this Rune Glaive, Rune Glaive, um, Nidalee, who's already like top two junglers, maybe even top jungler at the moment, probably the top jungler at the moment, will be even better. She doesn't care too much about the AoE um, because she has a lot of AoEs on her in her cougar form, um, but it's nice to have. She also has a lot of single target damage. And the double damage just adds to that crazy single target damage, that crazy good single target damage she already has. So her clear time is going to be even better with this item compared to before. Uh, even though she's going to see a little less damage because her auto attacks won't be magic damage, she can just use takedown, right? Takedown converts her auto attack into magic damage anyway. And that's, that's basically going to be it. Um, she's, she's still going to be dealing a massive amount of damage and probably even more than before. Now as for other AP junglers, um, at least Diana, Evelyn, and Kale, they can also use this item pretty well. Uh, they can actually use it a lot better than the older Rune Glaive, I would say, because of the double damage. Um, these champions, they're, they're just overall pretty good with Rune Glaive, uh, and they're, they're probably going to see a little more play. Maybe not like the, the best champions in the game, they, won't, they probably won't be the best champions in the game, um, but you'll probably see them a little bit more. Rune Glaive Kale is, is kind of the weird one. Runeblade Kale was already a, a mediocre jungler before, um, and most people like to play her with Devourer, but I think that Runeblade Kale is actually pretty strong. She's actually a pretty good champion if you don't let her you know, go that go with the, the slow game, the slow scaling game. If she gets that power spike in the early to mid game with Runeblade, she's actually pretty good if you build AP Kale. And this is especially considering the, uh, the recent changes to AP itemization, to Nash's Tooth especially, she likes the changes to Nash's Tooth and uh, AP Kill is going to be pretty good if you if you build a Rune Glaive. So like I said, um, with Nidalee, she got indirectly buffed by this Rune Glaive change, so expect some changes to Nidalee herself, since I doubt that they're going to be uh, nerfing Rune Glaive after overhauling it in the, in the last few patches. Really unlikely they're going to be changing Runeclave again. Um, and they're most likely going to be nerfing Natalie instead. Okay, so the final item on the list, I believe. Yeah, the final item on the list, Zeke's Harbinger. Zeke's Herald was transformed into Zeke's Harbinger. So Zeke's Herald, just to talk about the item a little bit, it was a situational item, and even then, it was mediocre at best. The stats were not bad, but not very slot efficient, and Zeke's Harbinger attempts to fix that. The item gives you a decent amount of armor, uh, mana, AP, and CDR. These are some of the stats that supports really enjoy, and the active is really, really cool. The active has a new mechanic that is potentially one of the most powerful in the game. So let's take a look at the active. The active binds yourself, binds the user to a target ally, and it removes all of the conduits on the ally. So the conduit portion is the passive. And let's get into that. Within a thousand range of each other, you and your ally generate charges, stacking until 100 charges are reached and lasting for 8 seconds. Attacks um, basically generate additional charges if you use them, and when you reach maximum charges, it causes all of the charges to be consumed, and it increases the AP and crit strike chance of both you and your ally for 6 seconds. It sounds pretty crazy on paper, right? And it is pretty crazy. This item is incredibly strong on basically everything. Crit strike is always good even if you don't have much AD. The basic attacks, having a chance to do double damage is really nice. Uh, AD carries with Infinity Edge and other AD items, this is ridiculously strong. 
but it's not just good on AP or on AD champions, it's good on AP champions because you also get that kind of pseudo death cap passive for 20% bonus AP. So AP champions, especially after 5.13, who uh, are getting generally a little more a little more AP on their items, are gonna have more AP if you create the conduit with them with Zeke's Harbinger. And there are also champions who benefit from both AP and crit strike. Hmm. AP champions who like to auto attack. Diana, Kogma, Kale, Kali, just to name a few. This item can be potentially really strong on those kinds of champions. And I feel like this will probably be a core item on supports. Maybe you buy a second or third item on most supports. Just because it gives you so much power. Zeke's Harbinger kind of changes the landscape of the game. Uh, when you're ahead, you can snowball your lead even more, and in the late game, when everyone has a ton of items, if you don't have this item, your team's DPS will actually be significantly worse than the enemy's DPS if they had the item. Uh, AP builds won't change too much since percent AP increase is pretty standard stuff. Uh, it's just overall more damage on your abilities, but I think AD builds might change a little bit. You might see AD carries favor Static Shib over Phantom Dancer again, so you don't overload on crit chance. Um, you'll still have the same amount of crit chance, 100% crit basically, um, and the added burst from Static Shiv, it's going to be 100% crit Static Shiv Chain Lightning. So you're just going to be dealing overall more damage. The trade-off is that you don't get the Ignore Unit Collision passive from Phantom Dancer as well as some attack speed, but there are other ways around that. You can buy other items for that if you want to. These are just some of my thoughts on the item, but the underlying fact of this item is that Zeke's Harbinger is incredibly powerful, and basically it's going to be a core item now, and you're going to be seeing it a lot more. Alright, so finally the monster changes. Uh, Dragon and Baron, they have a global death sound now, and it's not a bug, it's intentional now. And timers now update immediately upon death, regardless of whether you have vision or not. Now, this kind of change removes kind of the uh, existing micro aspects of the game, the timer taking and uh, estimating and the need to maintain constant vision for objective control. Um, but it makes it so that the game is more objective oriented, forcing you to plan ahead better. Um, because the game is giving you the information now, it's, it's basically hand feeding you the information now, making the game easier overall, but now you don't have an excuse to not plan for the next Dragon or Baron. You have to plan for this next objective. You should plan for the next one because this information is made actively ready to you. You, you always have this information no matter what. You can't make an excuse. Well, I don't have the timer. No, you have the timer now. You have to make plays now. Um, so hopefully this allows people to work for these objectives a little bit more or at least actively plan for these objectives a little bit more. The Rift Scuttle Alert, the Scuttle Crab. Um, before this patch, Charms, Taunts, Fears, and Fleas, as well as Aatrox's Dark Flight, did not debuff the Scuttle Crab. Stuns, knockups, and knockbacks, um, basically hard crowd control effects, they lowered the Crab's defensive stats to 10 from 60, which made it a lot easier to kill. Uh, now it's going to be more consistent, so basically every hard CC, every CC except for slows, I guess they're now going to create this uh, debuff on the Scuttle Crab permanently. So it's going to be easier to kill. And, and that's basically it for the, the monster changes. And that's actually it for this patch. Um, okay, I guess this bug fixes. Syndra can no longer pick up Baron with Force of the Bill. Wow. Those Syndra buffs though, right? That's a crazy buff, being able to pick up Baron. Alright, so uh, with that, I guess we've reached the end of 5.14, so let's do a little summary. Gangplank was reworked, MF got a visual update and very small changes. Gangplank is going to be a stronger teamfighter now, especially when you consider his powder keg and his ultimate, so I expect him to be a pretty good mid laner or top laner now. Azir is losing some of his initiation power. His unique passive is now going to be a more standard attack speed buff that most champions have, so he's going to be less unique. Uh, he's still good, but he's kind of stuck in that AP Marksman slash poke role instead of more of an initiator. He can still initiate, but it's just more dangerous now. 
Echo buffs Y. Uh, I kind of went on a rant on that, um, but Echo will be nerfed and or reworked in the future because he's pretty, pretty problematic. Just the, the champion in general, he's not even like... I don't know, like, he's, he's just a really problematic champion and um, Ryan needs to look at him. Elise, uh, massive buffs. She's going to be a contested pick for early aggression junglers now, um, especially because early aggression is more favored now. Tom Kench, some buffs that increase his base stats a little bit, his base damages. Um, he's still this kind of clunky, fat catfish frog thing, um, but the numbers here and there, they help him out greatly. You might see his W or E nerfed in the future, though. Early buff to Hunter's Machete for junglers who have trouble clearing in the early game, especially ones that spend a lot of mana. Uh, Rune Glaive is now awful as a lane item, but very strong in the jungle. It's also awful in team fights. You're not going to see AP Ezreal or garbage like that anymore, most likely. Um, Nidalee, he, she likes these changes a lot more than the other AP junglers, and she's probably going to get nerfed really soon. Zeke's Herald is now Zeke's Harbinger. It's an item that binds to allies and increases crit and AP, so it's potentially really great on everyone. It's a really powerful item that might get nerfed in the future, and it's probably going to be a core item on support. Very, very few items on support have actually become core items outside of Sightstone, and that's because support item versatility is very huge. When you have an item this powerful, you may not have that anymore. Alright, so now let's do a, a review of patch 5.13. Uh, 5.13 was the big patch, but I'm just going to go over it briefly, starting with the champions. Kalista is still one of the best AD carries, maybe top 3. Tristana, after all her buffs for like 3 or pa 4 patches in a row, uh, she's considered one of the strongest now. I think it's a pretty predictable pick. I expected this to happen in the past uh, couple patches, and I guess now it's just it's becoming a reality. Singed is bugged when he uses Rylice. His Poison Trail slows for 40% instead of 20%. Poison Trail is an AoE damage over time, but it applies the slow as if it were an AoE. Just an AoE. So that's why the 40% instead of the 20%. Devourer junglers, they suck for the most part. Um, in competent brackets of play, I should say. They just absolutely suck. Uh, I guess Diamond 5. It's Diamond 5 and below. Inclusive. Diamond 5 inclusive. Um, these are the brackets that like to use Devourer a lot more. When you go higher than that, not so much. Uh, Champions like Nidalee, Lee Sin, Kha'Zix, Elise, these kind of early aggression junglers, even if you want to play Jarvan or Vi, they also work. Uh, Nunu, Rek'Sai, Gragas from the tank junglers, all of these champions are still going very strong. Devour's early ramp up time is kind of gating the item really hard, despite it being a lot stronger overall and being easier to stack with the crab and the dragon giving bonus stacks. Shavana is probably the only Devour jungler at higher brackets who's being played more frequently, uh, and I guess Udyr with Devour isn't too bad. Sin Zhao is being played, but it's being played as a warrior jungler instead of Devourer jungler. Uh, it's a bit strange because he's actually pretty good with Devourer, um, but that's just how I've been seeing it. Um, not seeing much Jax. I, I thought that Jax would be a little bit better, but I guess his early weakness is kind of annoying, especially when you have Devourer, the Devourer stacking portion of the game, the early game. Is, is kind of a weak point as well, so when you have a double weakness, that's probably why you don't see him that much, even though he's really powerful in the late game. In lower brackets, like I said, Diamond 5 or lower, Devourer is more popular, but basically anything can be good in Diamond 5 or lower. So, it's not really saying much. As for the AP itemization changes, a lot of cool picks are now being considered, um, but because of how strong Victor and Azir are, uh, they're probably they're still like the, the top two champions that are being played, at least until now. We may see some changes soon. Uh, along with that, there are a lot of different builds now. Leandre's Torment is one of the main items that people like building now, just because it's really powerful, the 30 extra AP on it, as well as the burn effect makes it a really strong AP item. Even Nasher's Tooth is pretty good now when you get it as an early item, first or second item even, because it gives you stats that you like. It gives you 80 AP instead of the garbage 60 AP. Uh, it gives you cooldown reduction, which is very good on mages. It's very good stats for the early game, and the on-hit effect is just a, an added bonus. Rod of Ages and Tier of the Goddess stacking. Um, ridiculously strong as expected. Not much to say about that. I don't think people have embraced the uh, 
new Will of the Ancients yet, but I still think it's very good. There was a game where I was playing against the Yorick, and as most people know, Yorick has a lot of counterplay, right? No. But what happened was, uh, I had to buy Will of the Ancients as a second item, and it helped me in that matchup a lot more. Even though Yorick was buying uh, like Magic Resist to counter my damage, I was still dealing consistently good... Uh, not consistently good damage, but I was still healing for a decent amount when hitting him, so it did help a lot with his stupid poke. And that's basically the review of the last patch. Now, for the predictions I made last patch, I said that Jax was going to be really good. He's not, unfortunately, and that makes me really sad because I like playing Jax. Um, Shivana is good, so yay, at least I got that right. Um, Shivana's being played a lot. One of the few Devourer junglers that are actually pretty good after um, in, in higher level higher levels of play. So that's always a, a really nice thing to see. Early aggression junglers are now back, um, not just because they're strong against Devourer junglers, but because they're just good in general. Early aggression means faster games, which means more games will be played. And that's always fun, right? You can play more games because your, your games end faster. Ash and Tristana, they were my predictions for the top 80 carries, but uh, apparently people are saying that Corky is also considered a top 80 carry, but I'm not exactly sure why. I know he's good, but I don't think he's that good. But people think he is, so maybe maybe he is. Maybe he's just a lot better than I think he is. Uh, but Ash and Tristana, for sure, 80 carries, really good. Victor Azir, still top 2, um, but uh, Mage Diversity will catch up, especially after this patch. It's going to be a lot more picks, considering... Uh, the API itemization changes have been in-game for a while, it'll just take a little while for them to catch on. And I made a stupid prediction, uh, I said that someone in another region, maybe like LPL because they have crazy picks, they're gonna play top lane with Devourer, Poacher's Knife. Stupid prediction, nobody's doing that, and for good reason, it's absolutely terrible. Let's go with the 5.14 predictions now, more realistic predictions. Azir's gonna fall off a little bit from his pedestal, other AP champions will become stronger again, at least perception-wise. People are going to perceive them as being stronger. I'm going to say it again, Xerath, Lux, Swain, and Nivea, and I'll just leave it at those four champions for now. Uh, I guess Cassiopeia, okay? We can add Cassiopeia in there, so five champions. Cassiopeia is always good. So these are the champions that we may see have a resurgence now. Uh, Gameplank will be played to moderate success at best. For the next patch or two, as usual with champion updates and new champions in general, but I think people will catch on to his strengths shortly after. He may get some buffs to help him weather the storm for a bit, but people will realize the pirate is good. He's a good he's a good pirate. He's a good team fighter. Elise finally gonna be one of those top contested early aggression jugglers again. It's been a while, but I think she'll be back. Uh, Rune Glaive means no more stupid AP Ezreal. If you continue to play AP Ezreal after this patch, you're going to miss a lot of the key factors that made him good, so expect lower win rates. He still has good damage on his W and his ultimates, but his poke is significantly worse now. Rune Glaive in general is probably going to diversify the jungle a little bit, just because it makes jungle clearing in the mid game a lot better, so you may see more jungle picks, uh, more AP jungle picks. Finally, Zeke's Herald. It's going to be a core item on supports, second or third item. It's going to be a ridiculously crazy item, and if you don't build it, your team will be at a disadvantage. And that's it for 5.14. I, I tried to go through it quickly, ended up going through it a little bit slower than usual, uh, than I expected, not usual, but uh, that's basically it. So for those of you who stuck around the entire way, I always appreciate the dedication, just listening to me rambling on reading off some notes and whatever, talking about the patch, talking about League of Legends. And for everyone else, I guess, if you didn't follow through the entire way, still, thanks as always. Um, thanks to everyone for watching, and that will be it for me. I'll see you guys next time for patch 5.15. Have a good day. Goodbye.